Good morning, everyone. We're just letting everyone in from the waiting room and we'll get started here in one minute. Thanks all for being here. Good morning. Thanks everyone for your patience. If you're just joining, we're just letting the waiting room clear out and everyone get in and then we will get started here in a minute or two. Thank you.
All right, Kelsey, we should be good to go. Great, thank you. All right, so we'll hand it over to Kate McNamara with PIDC to get us started this morning. Thanks everyone and thank you all for being here. Thanks, Kelsey. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're really excited about this. I'm Kate McNamara, I'm the Senior Vice President for PIDC at the Navy Yard. And we have our Navy Yard team on today as well as our development partners at Ensemble um, and Mosaic as well as our uh, design consultant, Alan Greenberger. Um, and we're gonna be uh, just giving you a brief overview of the RFP that came out on Monday uh, that uh, many people have downloaded so far. If you haven't had a chance to, there's plenty of time. We're gonna walk you through kind of the expectations, what we're looking for. There's gonna be a long opportunity at the end to answer questions. Um, and as we go through this, just a, just a quick note for, um, two quick things. One is um, the, you know, the Navy Heart, the Navy Yard is a 1200 acre campus and we at PIDC are really proud of how it's um, evolved over the last 20 years and really provided a, just a ton of opportunity for companies and employees. Um, and we really wanna continue that in this next phase with our new development partners at Ensemble and Mosaic. Um, and to do that and to maximize the opportunities, both on the commercial and the residential and the public placemaking side, uh, we really want to make sure that the master plan sets a great course, a creative course, um, a really uh, efficient um, and dynamic course, and one that's really diverse and inclusive for the city to really make this place reflective of not only the companies that are there now, but also kind of the next uh, phase and making it really aligned very closely with what the city, city of Philadelphia is as it moves forward economically. So um, that's a big focus here. It seems a little bit daunting at first, but we have a lot to build on. Uh, we have two master plans that we've done in 2004 and 2013, as well as a pretty strong conceptual plan that Ensemble Mosaic is gonna walk you through later. Um, and some additional um, opportunities uh, with paid owned parcels as well. So even though it seems a little bit big and overwhelming at the beginning, um, I think as we walk you through it, it's a pretty concrete task. Um, and we are really excited to hear everybody's ideas for this and answer your questions. I'm gonna turn this back over to Kelsey and she's gonna start us off. Great, thank you, Kate. So just after a quick little bit of intro um, and kind of the Zoom housekeeping items, We'll go through the overview and strategic vision of what this master plan update is for the future of the Navy Yard. The Ensemble Mosaic team will talk through their development plan that they proposed upon in order to be selected as our development partner over the past year. We'll talk about some of the submissions procedures and protocols and then we'll have an open period for Q&A. So a few housekeeping items, please do remain on mute throughout this presentation. You'll hear from a few different PIDC and Ensemble Mosaic team members throughout. And the best way may be to go into speaker view and whoever is speaking at that time will be pinned. Um, you'll remain on mute, but feel free to submit any questions or comments into the chat box, either to everyone or you can submit them to me singularly and we'll answer questions in the Q&A portion, roughly in the order they're received in the, in the Q&A portion um, from the chat box, if we haven't already answered it throughout the presentation. Um, just a note that any questions that are asked through the chat can be repeated in the published Q&A document. They're considered public at that point. Um, this meeting is being recorded and it, we will circulate the recording afterwards in case members of your team weren't able to join this morning or you'd like to come back and review any portion of this morning's session. And lastly, a quick note on the teaming process. As Kate mentioned, this RFP may come across as extraordinarily comprehensive and a, a multidisciplinary project. And PIDC and Ensemble Mosaic are, are here to help and here to facilitate any teaming that may be necessary to put together a responsive team. Um, to that end, we will be circulating a list of people who have registered for this session, some of whom are actually in attendance this morning and some people who may not be able to actually log on right now. But we'll circulate that list later today. And once you receive that, feel free to go through that list, identify teams that you may be interested in learning more about and particularly looking into working with, 
and feel free to reach out to them or reach out to us at Navy Yard Plan at NavyYard.org and we're happy to help um, arrange introductions. Um, further to that end, we're gonna open up a poll in this Zoom right now. It's two questions. The first is just indicating if you and your team are interested in teaming with other consultants on this proposal. And secondarily, if your organization or firm is minority women or disabled owned business. Um, please respond to both of these questions if you're able. I know there are teams with multiple people on this call, so feel free to, y'all can all respond um, and we can sort it out on the back end or if you want one member of your team to respond, that also is perfectly fine. Um, this poll will stay open for a good portion of this session. So if you're having trouble finding it or need to come back to it, do feel free. Um, it, you should have a button in the bottom of your Zoom um, towards the middle that is a, a button that says polls. If it didn't just pop up for you, you should be able to click that button and have it pop up. And then if there's any contact information that you'd like updated from what you registered with to be included in this list, please just send that through to Navy Yard um, plan at NavyYard.org. And in terms of the certification, um, if you are certified in a, a city or state other than Philadelphia, that we will consider that as being certified. The Philadelphia Office of Economic Opportunity collates all the different certifications and registrations. And then just a quick orientation of the timeline. This is consistent with what's in the RFP, but um, just to orient us in the process, after this pre-bid meeting, there will be a two-week period for formal written Q&A in addition to the hour we have this morning. Um, we'll be re uh, circulating responses by Friday, January 29th to that. And then the deadline for RFP submissions is Friday, February 5th. Once we've received all of those and reviewed, we will be notifying a short list of respondents to be invited back for interviews that will take place at the end of February. And then we'll be notifying the selected team in early March. Kate briefly went over this, but just to kind of let you know who you'll be hearing from this morning on the PIDC Navy Yard team, you'll hear from Kate again, who is the senior vice president of the Navy Yard, Dylan Langley, who is the director of business development and leasing at the Navy Yard. Myself, I'm the project manager at the Navy Yard and Alan Greenberger is our design and development advisor to PIDC and to this project and process specifically. Um, from the Ensemble Mosaic team this morning, Brian Cohen and Mark Seltzer are here with us from Ensemble Real Estate and Greg Reeves and Leslie Smallwood are here from Mosaic Development. So with that, I will hand it back over to Kate. Great. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay, so just to kind of orient us all, uh, we thought it'd be helpful to talk about just the goals of the master plan and what we're trying to achieve. Because um, as, as I mentioned before, we did a major master plan in 2004. We updated it pretty comprehensively in 2013. So what is it we're asking you guys to do now? And it's a couple of things. Um, we really wanna kind of incorporate all the development that's happened since 2013. Um, and that includes a pretty significant build out in our corporate center, as well as some new public places and spaces um, that really kind of go into what the state of placemaking is at the Navy Yard today. Uh, we also want to incorporate the, the elements of Ensemble Mosaic's conceptual development plan that uh, position them to be selected as our next development partner at the Navy Yard. They're going to walk you through that later. That is, you know, it is a conceptual plan. So we're looking for you to kind of help us and help Ensemble work that into the Navy Yard in the most um, successful, exciting way possible. Um, and they can talk to you about elements that are gonna move quickly in that plan um, in the initial phase, and then other things that will have a longer um, lead time on them. And then, you know, PIDC is gonna retain ownership of a couple development sites. And the goal of that is really to augment the, the uh, economic activity and investment and development that Ensemble Mosaic is gonna be pursuing on the residential and commercial side. So how do we take our sites position them to keep uh, fulfilling our mission, but in a way that's complementary to what Ensemble and Mosaic are doing. Um, we also wanna really keep in mind that PIDC mission of economic development, investment, job creation, um, and really bringing those to the forefront in this plan. And for the first time, we are gonna have residential down here. Uh, that's a new thing for us. The Navy was 
um, really working with us for a long time to peel that restriction off a couple of the development sites. And so that's gonna be a question is how can we take residential and use that to really increase the density and increase uh, the activity level down here in a way that will generate amenities and retail and services uh, that ultimately allows us to attract more companies and more employees down here. So it's a whole kind of virtuous cycle here. Um, and then also really focusing on making the Navy Yard as it's kind of hitting this next stage of growth into a more inclusive uh, place, both for companies on the retail and commercial side, on the residential side, and also really in the public spaces, because as, um, as COVID has really kind of changed the way that everybody does things, uh, we've seen a tremendous uptick in public usage of the green spaces at the Navy Yard, and it's really been a, a positive for us, but also kind of made us realize that we weren't you know, we've really been a business campus up till this point. And as our identity changes moving forward, we really need to think about how we make those public spaces both integrated, inclusive, and uh, really kind of welcoming to not only the people working and living at the Navy Yard, but all residents of the city. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn this section over to Dylan, who's gonna walk you through some of the real estate pieces. Thanks, Kate, and good morning, everybody. So wanted to orient you in terms of where we sit in the region. We are a 1,200 acre campus at the southern end of Broad Street in Philadelphia. This puts us at the intersection of Philadelphia's two major highways, I-76 to the west and I-95 to the east, putting us within a 20 minute drive of both Delaware uh, and, and New Jersey. Um, and this also puts us within a five minute drive of the Philadelphia International Airport. Looking at the Navy Yard as it stands today, uh, since being acquired in 2000, there has been an investment of over $1.7 billion and it's now home to 170 companies with 15,000 employees. Major sectors include office, retail, industrial, hospitality, R&D, life sciences, and industrial. This looks at the two major districts that were offered during our development uh, developer RFP. So in the summer of 2019, we kicked off a developer selection and, and offered up two, two districts uh, comprising 109 acres. The historic district makes up 12 acres of that and the Mustin district makes up the remainder of that at 97 acres. Uh, the historic district, uh, the historic district here includes two adaptive reuse sites as well as two parcels for ground up construction. And a big reason for choosing the Ensemble Mosaic team is the fact that Ensemble is our largest private owner at the Navy Yard. They currently have 14, bu 14 buildings uh, comprised of 1.3 million square feet and what you see in the orange is known as the corporate center at the Navy Yard. And then the yellow here highlights the PIDC owned properties and sites. Uh, so, and Kelsey, if you wanna jump to the next slide here. Uh, these are the different sections that are highlighted in the RFP. So you have League Island Boulevard West in the Northwest corner there, the main gate assemblage, and then the historic core district as well. And from here, I'll hand it back over to Kate. Okay, thanks, Dylan. All right, so a um, couple of things on you know the long-term and short-term vision of both PIDC and Ensemble Mosaic for what we wanna do here at the Navy Yard in this next stage. Um, really kind of at the forefront is inclusive economic growth. And this is one of the reasons we were so impressed with Ensemble Mosaic as a potential development partner is their plan really stood apart from the rest in terms of not only attracting life sciences companies and uh, large scale commercial companies and corporate headquarters as we always have, but they also had a really um, pretty amazing commitment to bringing in smaller local companies um, minority-owned companies, women-owned companies, 
on the retail side, on the small business side, and helping us uh, really kind of incorporate that into the whole fabric of the Navy Yard. So that's something we really wanna do to kind of expand and uh, diversify the opportunity here. We're doing some other things on the uh, workforce training side with PIDC, and we'll continue to work with um, Ensemble Mosaic on that, as well as bringing in businesses on the construction and operation side, but really kind of spreading the opportunity to a broader segment of Philadelphians is at the forefront of what we wanna do here. Um, building on the success of the Navy Yard, both for large and small businesses, uh, PIDC is really committed to covering all ends of the spectrum and providing opportunities for everyone. Um, and then one of the sectors that has really seen tremendous growth here in Philadelphia is the cell and gene therapy sector really centered around University City at the beginning, um, but just clamoring for space, particularly on the production side as these therapies come into the commercial phase and get their FDA approval. Um, the Navy Yard is really one of the few and possibly the only uh, site for these kind of large floor plate, one to two story facilities uh, for manufacturing. And so we have uh, two of those facilities right now. We would like to grow that uh, to more. Ensemble Mosaic can expand on that. Uh, their team has really done a lot of the work on that through their prior experience with Liberty Property Trust. Um, so we feel like we have a lot of expertise in this sector and it's a great opportunity, not just for the Navy Yard, but also for, um, for the city of Philadelphia as a whole in this sector. Next slide. One of the other challenges is we really wanna take this residential opportunity and it's got to, you know, basically create a neighborhood where there is none today. And that's a pretty tall order. So we want to make sure we do it in a creative way, in an inclusive way, um, and one that really integrates uh, those uses with everything around them in a positive way that, uh, that achieves uh, a really big impact in the end. Um, we also want to use that development to drive these amenities and retail that we talked about. That's something that is really crucial in terms of business attraction, especially on the life sciences side. And so to, to get these um, different types of uses to work together and really attract and support those amenities is crucially important. Next slide. And then we mentioned um, earlier, you know, really keeping the focus on business attraction, creating you know, really viable commercial sites that Ensemble and Mosaic can use to attract uh, new commercial tenants to create jobs. Um, and then also really, you know, focusing on the placemaking. That's one thing that has really made the Navy Yard stand out. It's something that the planning previously has been absolutely critical for in terms of making sure that the new construction with some really great architecture works with the grand old buildings at the Navy Yard, that the green spaces and the landscape architecture all work together in a cohesive way. And we wanna make sure that that continues. Um, and then also uh, we really wanna you know, continue the Navy Yard's uh, kind of unique status as a lab for new technologies, using those to really kind of propel the campus forward um, both in terms of energy, smart cities, um, multimodal transportation, circulation within the campus, all of those things. And we, you know, we have a little bit of a unique ability to do that here because of our unregulated electric grid, as well as uh, these are not city streets down here for the most part, they are privately owned streets. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility. So while that's, that's not at the forefront of this plan, it certainly is an important element of it that we wanna see. And I'm gonna hand it over here to Dylan. Thanks, Kate. So looking at some of the planning challenges as well as opportunities here. One, we are creating a residential market here at the Navy Yard. And for the first time ever, we'll have private citizens living at the Navy Yard. Uh, so how does that look in terms of creating a new market, defining and coordinating the, the retail strategy that goes along with it? as we'll now have a 24 seven lifestyle campus. Uh, life sciences, we obviously wanna bring life sciences as Kate mentioned to the Navy Yard. Um, this will allow the Navy Yard to create a unique value proposition and regional uh, positioning strategy. The infrastructure were, as I mentioned, 97 acres are in the Mustin district, which is essentially a, a greenfield site. Uh, and we will need to bring 
new infrastructure to that area, we will need to think about transportation and addressing the accessibility and connectivity of the entire plan. And then the environment with Muslin District being a greenfield site, we do need to look at wetlands and, and managing the floodplain and stormwater systems. And then how does this all fit in terms of public spaces? As Kate mentioned, we are primarily a business park today uh, and we will be shifting over to having residential. How do we incorporate these public spaces and what does that look like so that it's an inclusive space and it, it provides access to all? And from here, I will turn it over to Brian Cohen with Ensemble to talk about the Ensemble Mosaic Conceptual Development Plan. Thank you, Dylan. Um, before we get into the development plan itself, um, I just wanted to give a quick introduction uh, of Ensemble, uh, and then I'll ask our joint venture partners uh, to introduce themselves as well. Um, so Ensemble Real Estate Investments, we are a full service real estate company. Um, we develop, own, lease, and manage all product types from office to residential, retail, hotel, life science properties. Uh, we're headquartered in Long Beach, California, uh, but we've been in business for over 30 years. Um, and during that time, we've completed several billion dollars worth of development, uh, historically focused uh, more on the West Coast. Uh, but since uh, 2012, Ensemble has invested over 350 million at the Navy Yard. Um, as part of that investment, uh, we've opened Ensemble East, uh, and the Ensemble East office is located at the Navy Yard. Uh, it's headed by myself and Mark Seltzer. Uh, and between the two of us, uh, you know, Mark and I have extensive experience with our time uh, at Liberty Property Trust, and then Mark with also with PIDC, uh, developing at the Navy Yard. Uh, really, you know, since the 2005 timeframe. Uh, so we're really excited to continue that work uh, and, uh, you know, use that experience, but uh, look forward to kind of new ideas and, and uh, new opportunities uh, going forward. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our joint venture partner, uh, Mosaic. Uh, good morning. Hi, I'm Greg Reeves, and Leslie is with me in the crowd somewhere. It's hard for me to see where I see where you are now. Uh, um, uh, Leslie and I started Mosaic in 2008. We've worked with some of the folks who are on the call, and uh, it's great to have you all here and listen in on our on on this presentation at the Navy Yard. Uh, we started Mosaic in 2008. Leslie and I met at a mid-level real estate development company where we were part of the leadership team that managed about 5 million square feet of real estate in the greater Philadelphia area. We decided to go off on our own, frankly, because there were two issues that we were looking to address. One was uh, the relative lack of inclusion of people of color in the commercial real estate business. And second, the lack of investment in communities of color that were disenfranchised. And so our complete focus was on both. Uh, in 12 years, that we've been in business. Uh, we've invested about $120 million in Philadelphia neighborhoods and really working on solutions around mixed income, mixed cultural dynamics through the acquisition and redevelopment of real estate assets in some of Philadelphia's most difficult neighborhoods. And uh, what's been great about that and particularly working with Ensemble and PIDC and frankly, PIDC has been with us along the way. We've done about four projects with PIDC since we've uh, constituted our company was that it's really given us some great tools and lessons about how to scale uh, mixed income, mixed community development, and really working on wealth building and inclusion of both minority and women owned businesses, but also how do we look downstream at development to bring in communities of color and give them real access to some of the great things that other communities have access to. So part of uh, the ecosystem here is really to expand that process with a great partner in both PIDC and uh, Ensemble.
so uh, what you have here is this is a con conceptual development plan. And uh, overall, what we've done is we've looked in particularly three areas. One is the historic core, uh, which is a combination of both uh, adaptive reuse, but ground up real estate. And we'll talk in greater detail about that. Uh, the second would be what we're calling Mustin North. Mustin North is in the turquoise color, essentially. Uh, and what you can see there is that's our real focus on life sciences. And then the third is Mustin South, and that's the waterfront, uh, essentially, what we're doing in terms of an expansion on the waterfront. We have really focused in uh, as our first phase in the historic core and really what we're calling the chapel block. We're gonna get into some greater detail in future slides around that, but that really co consists of uh, really the start of the residential development. Uh, and that's what you're seeing in red in the residential component uh, off to the left. I don't know if you can see mostly red and orange, but when we are uh, moving forward, we have our first phase that's the chapel block. We'll talk in detail about that. We have a future phase that is the historic core that was really focused on adaptive reuse. We have about 1.6 million square feet in existing buildings that we're redeveloping and we're really looking for some great ideas around that area. As we're doing that, we're really starting to build out the Mustin District, which is Mustin North around a focus of bio and life sciences. Uh, and uh, Kate already mentioned, we're primarily focused on cell and gene therapy, messenger RNA. And, uh, and particularly new uses in science and how science is really progressing in the future. And then we're looking really at Mustin South as kind of the, uh, I, won't, I won't say the final piece, but really what we see is a high value proposition where we're asking our teams, that the selected team, to really come in and work with us to think about what is the highest and best strategy considering the other work that we're doing. So uh, we're really excited about the ideas that are going to come forward uh, in these three key areas, and particularly in the Mustin district, uh, that will be a, a key focus for us. So with that. This is a uh, conceptual development plan. Uh, two, uh, overall, it's 2.5 million square feet of life sciences, but we're somewhere around 5.4 million square feet in total development. Uh, we're planning for at least 2,800 residential units. We might be 100 units plus that, I think, in our plan. Uh, the retail and maker space will be a critical element of that. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at both in terms of what are the essential uses that we need to bring in a residential community that augments both the residential people that are coming as well as the existing businesses that are there. Uh, and the future businesses that are coming. And then secondly, to layer that in a post COVID environment, what do we believe are really the best uses for the future? We've got some, some ideas that we think work. We really wanna tap into kind of the leading ideas. Uh, in addition, we think our ideas are leading frankly, but, <laughs> but the other leading ideas <laughs> so that come to bear as, as a consequence of this development, we really do want some of the most progressive thinking about where the future of retail is going, how it's going to adapt to a space that has really uh, uh, an open canvas, a new canvas of a development for Philadelphia. And then what are we gonna do to preserve the ability for companies that haven't really had chances at such a great address to be able to prosper here? And primarily we're focused significantly on bringing minority and women owned companies in the retail space that can come to this location and can be successful. So that's a part, a key part of how we're looking at this prospect. Uh, there's a big parking requirement that comes here as well. Uh, we have uh, committed to building a, a, a series of parking garages as part of the infrastructure that should be taken into account in this development. Uh, it has been defined by our team, by the minimum amounts that we believe we need, but we're certainly looking forward to hearing from the broader team about what, how we think that would be constituted, particularly as we look in the landscape of the next 15 years. I will just, uh, I think I will turn this piece over to Brian. Sure. Um, thank you, Greg. Uh, so 
Uh, what I will do is I am going to dive into a little bit more detail uh, into uh, each of the districts, um, starting with the historic core. Uh, as Greg mentioned, uh, this is um, really envisioned as the Navy Yards downtown uh, and represents really the initial activity and the first residential uh, component at the Navy Yard ever. Um, so what you see here uh, on the left uh, is kind of the conceptual plan that our team had pulled together uh, that really looks at how we incorporate the uh, new development sites, the historic buildings, um, which are the two loft uh, industrial buildings, one in blue, one in green uh, in that plan. Uh, and, you know, thinking about this particular area uh, to the uh, north is the corporate center. Uh, so there is a density of, of people and activity that exists there. Uh, and really, to the west uh, is the Urban Outfitters campus and the remaining area of uh, the historic district, um, which uh, you know has its own kind of center of gravity and density. So in many respects, the, this historic core area represents the hole in the donut. Um, and that's where we really look to build upon the confluence of all the uses, um, both commercial um, uh, industrial, uh, the historic architecture, the new progressively designed buildings in the corporate center, and create this vibrant residential campus. Uh, so uh, as you'll see, we've kind of envisioned this obviously occurring in phases. This represents about a total of 1,900 residential units, um, several hundred thousand square feet of retail and maker space um, and uh, also uh, a new historically renovated hotel. Next slide, please. Concurrent with the master planning efforts um, in order to kind of capitalize both on uh, the opportunity and uh, activity at the Navy Yard, uh, the Ensemble Mosaic team will be uh, proceeding with its initial phase of development. Uh, so this is it will be a concurrent design process. Uh, we will be asking the master plan teams uh, to take into account the um, uh, development that uh, and the design that is occurring uh, on what we're referring to as the chapel block. And that initial uh, kind of phase on what we're calling on the, ch the chapel block uh, really leverages on a few of Ensemble's existing assets. Uh, so beyond the chapel, what's identified here is the chapel block itself, where we would develop approximately 600 residential units uh, and between 25 and 40,000 square feet of retail, we would concurrently be designing and developing uh, 1200 Normandy, uh, which is envisioned to be a three to four story, 75,000 square foot uh, lab building. The Barracks Hotel, uh, which will be approximately a 230 room, four star hotel, um, his a historic renovation, adaptive reuse project uh, with uh, you know a full uh, slate of, of amenities. And uh, all, all of that development really centered around uh, what we referred to as Chapel Plaza. And I'll talk about Chapel Plaza here in, in a moment. Um, but this is really about creating uh, a, a, an initial density and scale uh, that we think in addition to those residents, uh, the addition of the hotel guests, um, the lab building, um, really creates a center of gravity that will be very attractive uh, to that, those target residents. Next slide. I mentioned the Chapel Plaza. Um, and again, this is a, a critical component of uh, this initial phase because um, we've always seen at the Navy Yard, um, while great architecture um, you know, is, is critical, 
Um, really what makes a place is the space that's kind of in between the buildings. Um, and just to the north uh, of uh, this development uh, is the almost five acre uh, Central Green Park that was designed by James Corner Field Operations and was completed, uh, well, started design almost 10 years ago and completed about six years ago. Um, what we wanted, what we envision here is a partial closure of 12th Street uh, right in front of uh, the Barracks Hotel, which is on the right, and the newly developed, uh, one of the newly developed residential buildings on the left, uh, with the uh, historic Chapel of the Four Chaplains uh, obviously remaining uh, and a critical component of this plaza. And what we envision here is really an, uh, an intimate public space um, where these buildings can kind of spill out uh, into uh, that space and really acts as a, a great transition to the uh, Central Green Park, uh, which is just an incredible public space and amenity for everyone uh, at the Navy Yard. Next slide. Moving over to the Mustin North, um, I think this is uh, really a very uh, interesting site for uh, us and, and the planning team. Uh, this is really where we envision this life science, um, R&D and manufacturing district. Um, we see this as really having a complete ecosystem for life science companies uh, with uh, somewhat of a focus on the commercialization phase of those companies. Historically in Philadelphia, uh, a lot of these companies started um, at Penn or CHOP in University City in the Science Center. Um, and as they grew and commercialized, there really was not much of an opportunity in the city of Philadelphia um, to, for, for those facilities. So they either move to the suburbs or they may mo have moved out of market. Uh, the opportunity that we see here at the Navy Yard uh, really relates to the ability to do these larger footprint, one to two story buildings, which are extremely desirable uh, to these life sciences companies, uh, particularly as CGMP facilities. Um, so, the Navy Yard already has uh, some success, as Kate mentioned, uh, with some of these facilities. Uh, so we're really looking to leverage that success, the, the land asset that we have and that ability to build these uh, uh, larger footprint buildings, uh, the incredible labor force that exists in the Philadelphia region um, around the life science industry. Um, and, and just as critical, the great logistics characteristics that Dylan mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and specifically the proximity to the airport. Um, as it relates to cell and gene therapies, uh, the product that they're dealing with is, is usually blood. Um, and so the critical nature of having that proximity to the airport where they are receiving and shipping all throughout the world um, becomes a very important location attribute for uh, these companies. What we envision uh, in this district um, is something that has a very kind of corporate high-end architecture and front and experience uh, for both the employees um, and their guests and visitors and customers, um, but there's a focus on functionality with these buildings. Uh, this is the new manufacturing, and manufacturing is a process, and that process requires very specific uh, functional requirements. Um, and, th and, and that really represents the kind of unique opportunity that we have here. Um, it also provides the uh, ability for larger companies to have its own mini campus. You can see in the plan on the left here the ability to group buildings, the ability to connect buildings, um, and the flexibility in this plan for those reasons will be key. This will be user driven. Um, and so the ability to make buildings larger, smaller, um, more stories, less stories, um, really will be critical in the success of this particular district. 
Um, while the opportunity is just an incredible one and one that Ensemble and Mosaic are excited about and PIDC is very excited about, uh, this district does have its challenges. Uh, we have, um, you know, several wetland areas currently in this in this district. Uh, there is a lack of, of really any infrastructure that exists in this district. Um, and a majority of the land area is currently below the floodplain. So these are all challenges that we're going to need to consider as we go through our planning exercise. Next slide. Um, what you see here is a, a little bit of a model shot that was created off of our concept on the left. Um, and you know what, what this really tries to start to explain from, from what we envision in this district is that you know, we do want to create a corpus, ca corporate campus environment. How we envision that occurring was really creating what we referred to as a greenway. Uh, which is you see in the rendering on the right, kind of a series of naturally landscaped vehicular and pedestrian paths that also serve a, a vital stormwater management function. Um, however, again, getting to kind of functionality, we really need to think about access and the separation of vehicular, pedestrian, and truck traffic. Um, and trucks are critical to these facilities. So thinking about access, uh, how access works and how to keep, uh, you know, uh, those trucks separate from uh, the, the regular cars and, and the pedestrian. Um, also critical in these buildings is the, the loading and the equipment, um, equipment both on the roof, uh, but equipment and uh, on, the, on the ground level. Uh, so figuring out creative ways to hide uh, those, you know, less you know, aesthetically pleasing uses. Um, and then lastly, the, the parking. Um, and, you know, we really envision uh, a very um, comprehensive and detailed parking strategy that uh, will be part of this plan. Um, we've envisioned structured parking and shared parking structures that are really hidden in the middle of these buildings where a lot of the loading uh, and the equipment uh, will will also occur, um, but that is uh, will be a big component of the study that we'll want to do um, in understanding how sh how those shared parking structures uh, will work, how they should be appropriately sized, um, and how they should be screened uh, and and really hidden from kind of the public realm. Next slide. Lastly, uh, Muston South, um, and while the historic core and Muston North um, are intended to be developed uh, really concurrently uh, at the onset uh, of, of our development, it's a vision. It's envisioned that a majority of the Muston South district will occur, mostly occur in in kind of a, a later phase. Um, that'll allow the infrastructure the activity and density to really converge from both the north and the Muston North District, as well as the west in the historic core district, um, and ultimately culminate on what we think is uh, the most exciting component uh, of this opportunity. Kelsey, did we all lose uh, audio? Or Brian, Brian? Brian lost audio. Uh, okay. okay. He's trying to reconnect. So. Yeah. Okay. Brian, you're on mute, but it looks okay. like you're back. Okay, I apologize. Yes, I somehow got disconnected. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, so I do apologize about that. Um, so we will lo really look to capitalize in this Muston South District on the success of the historic core and Muston North, but we envision really a perfectly refined and dense waterfront district where these new buildings and these incredible public spaces 
meet the water uh, and creating a true mixed use district with residential, retail, office, life sciences, and world-class public space. And that really will need to be supported by a robust activation program. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, the retail um, with restaurants, vibrant public spaces, creative waterfront programming um, that we believe will make this Philadelphia's most prized neighborhood. Um, our concept envisioned uh, approximately a thousand residential units, uh, a million square feet of office and lab space, and about 100,000 square feet of retail uh, and maker space. So with that, um, I will turn it back over to Dylan. Thank you, Brian. So it's been it's been mentioned that this is a comprehensive scope. It's it looks like a daunting task from the outset, uh, but we do want to reiterate that we have a strong foundation. So between the comprehensive uh, conceptual plan that Ensemble Mosaic came to us with, we also have two master plans that were done previously, one in 2004 and one in 2013. So the key priorities of this scope are the cohesive integration of that conceptual plan and making sure that it all comes together. We wanna to look at it, review it, refine it, confirm what we believe works, uh, but there may be changes to what they've presented. The other, the other idea is that we wanna build on the public spaces, the waterfront and the inclusivity of welcoming all Philadelphians to the Navy Yard. There's going to be dense, vibrant residential development and it's going to support retail and other amenities. As mentioned earlier, we haven't had residential at the Navy Yard, and this will be a new market that we're testing out. We are fully confident in it, and we believe that it will bring strong amenities and retail to the Navy Yard. Um, the entrance, again, we want the Navy Yard to be inclusive and accessible to all. So how do we reposition some of the assets that we have at the, at the entrance? Um, and that includes thoughtful transportation plan and parking solutions, parking garages, surface parking, uh, the future of vehicular access. What does that look like and how is that incorporated? And then also incorporating sustainability. LEED certification has been tremendously important at the Navy Yard. It's one of the requirements that we look to have at the Navy Yard and we want to build upon that success and we want to make sure that that's something that we maintain going forward. This ensemble mosaic has come to us with really a 20 year plan and we want to make sure that whatever is presented via the master plan has longevity and that it all ties together both from today's standpoint as well as 20 years in the future from, from now. A big component of our entire project with the ensemble mosaic development partnership has been this participation diversity equity and inclusion. We look for minimum participation requirements. In the RFP, as you'll see, there is a minimum participation of 40% MBE and WBE combined. So how does that work from your standpoint? We require that the MBE and WBE metrics be met from at a minimum by the Office of Economic Opportunity. And then how you make up the remainder, that's at your discretion. Uh, but we do expect a minimum of 40% for MBE and WBE participation. Uh, this should be a inclusive planning process for all, and we want meaningful MBE and WBE participation. We're not just looking to hit metrics. We want to ensure that there is meaningful participation. And this is really the first step in kicking this off. So it's tremendously important that we hit these metrics. And Kelsey? Great, thank you, Dylan. So again, um, just a few quick last items on the, the kind of submission protocol, just again, highlighting the timeline here. Um, we'll go through the Q&A in just a moment, but there is also the written portion, the written period of which you're welcome to send in questions and we will recirculate those with responses. And once the deadline has passed and we've conducted any interviews, we will be notifying in March. 
In terms of the kind of content of what we look to receive in the proposals, there is a statement of qualifications to clarify that's defined as a five page limit. And in those five pages, you should respond to the qualifications and relevant project experience using up to five project examples of the lead team and to the extent possible also addressing sub consultant. Um, experience and qualifications in that period. Um, there is also a, a requirement for any disclosure of conflicts of interest and reference information that can be held outside of that five page um, minimum or requirement, sorry. And then the rest of the proposal, the bulk of it will be the explanation of work in response to the scope that's outlined. Um, your, your team's work plan and schedule response to the deliverables that are outlined in each area of this project the project timeline and your overall compensation for the project and response to the economic opportunity plan and um, participation elements that Dylan just spoke through. And then lastly, there are some requirements for forms and certifications, and we'll make sure that you have all of those forms provided if they haven't already been, and, and any exceptions to the scope that are encapsulated in what you've proposed should be disclosed so that we can understand what elements of the scope you may have separately priced and considered and or things that you've added to the scope. And lastly, this information is also in the RFP, so you're welcome to go back and read, but just wanted to quickly highlight what the criteria that we'll be using when we evaluate and eventually select a project team for this. Um, these were, are in no particular order and some will be weighted more than others, but generally speaking, we'll be looking to the qualifications and experience. Your team structure, including the clarity of the different roles, and again, as Dylan mentioned, meaningful roles for the MBE, WBE consultants on the team. Um, an understanding and alignment with the strategic vision and the development goals that we just spoke through this morning. Um, the quality, creativity, and feasibility of your scope response. and encapsulated in that an understanding of the scope requested, your team's capacity to deliver the scope and in a timely fashion, and again, the commitment to meet or exceed the MBE WBE participation goals that are outlined, and lastly, the total fee and overall value for the services being offered in the proposal. So with that, we'll transition into the question and answer portion. Um, again, we've gotten some questions through the chat. Please feel free to keep sending those. We'll answer them um, in the order received as best as we can. And thank you in advance for patience as we walk through them all. Um, any questions submitted here will be could be published. And um, we ask that you do remain on mute throughout this. If you feel that your answer, you didn't receive a full response to your question, feel free to send a follow-up in the chat box or email Navy Yard plan at navyyard.org and we'll ensure that a, a comp as comprehensive a response as we can provide is offered in the, the written responses that will come out in a few weeks. So to start, um, let me address the question of a few of the different scope elements and kind of clarity around those. Um, so I'll pass this off to Kate after reading it, but um, could you address the wayfinding strategy portion of the scope? Is this a, a new full branding and wayfinding package or is it something that's going to leverage and expand existing wayfinding and branding that we have across the Navy Yard? So that is a great question. Um, and I think we're looking to the teams to really propose something here. And the reason why is that, you know, in addition to building out the historic core, which has the wayfinding and branding program, we also are incorporating this brand new Muston district that has no streets, no utility infrastructure. Um, and so we really want to have a comprehensive based program that works together. So we're looking to the teams to really propose what they think works best here um, and work with, work with us to, uh, to build that out. All right, and then I've kind of bundled a few different questions we've received regarding the infrastructure. So the first question, um, is the infrastructure private or public? And Kate, I'll defer to you for that one. Sure. So so there's different components of the infrastructure um, in terms of the roads that will be built in the Mustin district. 
Um, these will be owned by Hade, which is our land holding entity. Um, but everything that we do now on the roadside is built to city specifications um, with the goal that at some point we should go back to the city. And in order to do that, they're gonna to have to be consistent with the city's uh, guidelines and requirements. Um, in terms of utilities, uh, we operate the electric grid down here. So that infrastructure up to the DMARC point um, and up to the connection, the delivery point from Pico, that will remain under uh, ownership of the paid electric utility. Um, and then the other utilities, you know, similar to any other place in the city, they'll, you know, they'll control it up to the DMARC point. And then after that, it belongs to the, the owner of the development. Um, Ensemble Mosaic may have some additional comments on that. Sure. Um, I, I, Kate, I think you characterize it correctly, um, just related to uh, uh, water uh, systems, both uh, sanitary, um, domestic, and stormwater. Um, obviously, on site, uh, the D mark for, for those is typically uh, at the street. Um, the rest of those utilities uh, are uh, developed and constructed by the developer, um, but turned over to PWD. Um, PGW, similar, uh, PGW will own uh, the utility, uh, their gas lines up to uh, the manifold uh, for each property. Um, uh, and I think Kate covered uh, uh, electric. And we had another question about any utility and infrastructure base mapping that's available pre-2013, the last time we did the master plan and post-2013, and if this information would be provided to the winning team in CAD or GIS format. And we do have some of those documents and we'll be providing as much as we can to, to the winning team once selected. Continuing on the in, uh, infrastructure theme, we also had a question about the environmental water quality at the waterfront. And similarly, whether consultant teams will be responsible for evaluating seawall and a hydrology study. And Kate, I don't know if you wanna respond yeah. to that first. So in terms of environmental quality of water, I'm not sure if you're referring to at the location of the seawall where it meets the Delaware. I don't, I don't think we're asking for that. Um, I also don't think we're asking for um, a conditions assessment of the seawall. Uh, if there's a reason you think that that would be necessary, definitely submit a question um, kind of detailing why and we can give it some additional analysis. Um, but I think we probably don't need that nor a hydrology analysis. Um, but again, if you think there's a specific reason why that would be helpful, definitely let us know and we can take it up again. And Ensemble Mosaic, if you have any additional thoughts on it, jump in. Yeah, uh, the only additional comment that I would have is it, it is likely that we will need to do new, at least one new outfall uh, for stormwater management uh, into uh, the Delaware River. Um, and that, uh, as part of our comprehensive kind of stormwater management uh, plan, would be part of uh, the master plan and kind of determining, uh, you know, how, whether that is necessary, where that would be located, um, so that we have a, 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 you know, obviously a working stormwater management system. And then a question about transportation um, just generally if there's any expansion that you could provide on the transportation element of the, the planning scope and how any local site transportation circulation will be coordinated with the city's mobility plan. Sure. So I think what we're envisioning here is a couple of things. Uh, we want to definitely explore the connections between the Navy Yard and other key places. So, you know, things like the Broad Street subway extension for years have been planned, very, very expensive projects. Um, 
Different people have different thoughts on its viability. I think we really want to identify all options to connect. Um, also, University City has become a more important connection. Things like that, really kind of thinking through what's coming in the next 10 to 20 years and how we should prepare for it. But doing that from a, from a perspective of practicality. Here's all the options. Here's the ones that make the most sense in the short to medium term. And here's the ones you should be thinking about for the longer term, but reasons why they may or may not be um, worth putting a ton of effort into. Um, in terms of access within the Navy Yard, I think one of the challenges, and Ensemble Mosaic can speak to this in more detail, but one of the challenges is really capacity in terms of parking, in terms of ability to handle single occupant vehicles, and you know, especially with the advent of residential at the Navy Yard, making sure that this all works together in a way that is efficient and not frustrating for the employees and residents down here. And so part of that is gonna be parking, um, both in terms of adding a structured component, which is something Ensemble Mosaic are, have incorporated into their conceptual plan. Um, other things like park and ride, mobility solutions uh, within the Navy Yard, you know, everything from exploring, um, you know, driverless uh, shuttles or, you know, kind of the next stage of technology, additional um, building out the bicycle, share system, uh, pedestrian amenities, all of those things are gonna be really important to you know, avoiding a situation, you know, somewhat like University City where the congestion, where the activity is there, but the congestion is you know, really a frustration for the people who work and live there. So uh, kind of thinking through all those different pieces of it. And I think the question is really good because the other thing we need to do is coordinate with the city. Um, because Otis and Streets are really doing some amazing work on this, uh, both in terms of alternative transportation, making transportation safer, um, new modes. We're actually working with them on a couple of uh, potential pilot projects, um, trying to find funding for those. So any opportunities like that where, you know, we should definitely be you know, consistent with the city and aligned with them, but also kind of thinking forward to opportunities where we can collaborate with them and maybe test out things at the Navy Yard that could then be deployed on a larger scale um, throughout the city. And I'd, I'd just like to echo Kate's point about kind of uh, looking at it as somewhat of a pilot because uh, we, we all know the, the current circumstances of where the Navy Yard is located, or at least uh, folks in Philadelphia do. I, it's going to be important that we really do think there's a current shuttle that supports the Navy Yard today. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about extending the subway, the cost there for those who have been involved. They know that right now it's prohibitive. Uh, the, the real issue is what should we be doing for the future of the Navy Yard, uh, both uh, near term, that's realistic. But I think this is an opportunity for the teams to start thinking really progressively about how transportation should occur in a space of that size. And then really what's the end user really doing? You know, we work a lot with millennials in the city and fewer and fewer of them have cars. So it's really talking about what is the shared strategy moving out of COVID. We, we're going to have an immediate effect because of COVID, but then we want to look long-term about what's really the right strategy for the Navy Yard that, uh, that draws both connectivity to and then connectivity through uh, those spaces. Great, thank you all. So just trying to keep all the questions organized here. Um, we have gotten a few questions um, related to a few administrative items. So let me address some of those really quickly. Um, first of all, we will be sending out a list of everyone who is in attendance this morning um, and or who has registered for this event if they weren't able to actually log in. And that will be sent out to everyone here and everyone who's registered so that you can review for potential teaming. Um, there should be a poll still open in your Zoom. Um, if you don't see a poll window, try, there's a button on the bottom toolbar in Zoom called polls that if you click should open up. And you can there indicate if you're, you and your organization are open to teaming and if you and your organization are MBE, WBE or DSBE um, certified which will be important information for the list. Um, 
quickly speaking a little bit about the roles of PIDC and Ensemble Mosaic in this process going forward, um, we will be sort of operating on a, a, a steering committee, as it's been called in the RFP, and we'll be providing insight as to organizing and running the stakeholder public meetings. But Kate, if you want to elaborate on the expectation for the, the planning team to handle that, as well as any collaboration with the current Ensemble Mosaic design team. Sure. So, so one of the things, um, as soon as we have a winning team with a proposal, um, we'll start working on the stakeholder outreach and engagement um, process. And, you know, it's it's a little bit unique at the Navy Yard because we because we don't have residential, so there's not as much uh, community engagement as in, in other, you know, more traditional areas of the city. But you know, we do work with a lot of stakeholders in South Philadelphia, um, our employers here, of course. Um, so we can work with you to come up with a really good plan on that. And then in terms of uh, maybe Ensemble Mosaic might be willing to answer the second part of that question, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. About collaboration with the current Ensemble Mosaic design team, and if so, who are members of that team? Uh well, Brian, I don't know if you want to take it or we can we can take it. I, we're, that's still being defined. Uh, uh, we at at this point and uh, for the near future, the team that's on the call uh, is really kind of the leadership team for the Navy Yard. Uh, we are going to be bringing other uh, design consultants in with us. Uh, we're vetting that process now with respect to specifically uh, the Chapel Block. Uh, but but uh, once a selected team is in place, we'll be able to put all of that information together for you. Yes, uh, Greg, I think that's correct. I'll, I'll add, there, I think there's really two components to this. There is, uh, as Greg mentioned, the, that initial phase uh, on the chapel block that will be happening concurrent. Uh, we do expect that uh, there will be a lot of coordination between that team and the selected master plan team. Um, uh, separately, um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'll say exactly which component the question was targeted at, um, related to the concept plan uh, that our team created for, uh, for that submission. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that that coordination would really be occurring through our Ensemble Mosaic uh, leadership team. Um, and, you know, versus directly with uh, the team that uh, worked with us on that RFP submission. Great. Thanks, Brian. And just to perhaps reiterate what you just said, but to make sure that we're responding to another question received, it is envisioned that the, the master planning team would have an early in the process an opportunity to review and refine, as mentioned, the work that has already been put together in Ensemble Mosaic's conceptual plan. Definitely, yes. Um, so now a couple of questions about residential. Um, Leslie, I'll let you start out on some of these. Um, the first is who will own and operate the residential facilities? Uh, we will. The, the development team and sponsor will own. And they, they are all rental units. Um, there's not for, for sale or ownership available in the Navy Yard. Okay, thank you. And then can you address um, the envisionment of affordable housing and any requirements or allocations of affordable or workforce housing in the plan? Yes, um, there, there is a minimum requirement of 15% of affordability, and uh, it is that a minimum requirement. If we can achieve more, that's even better. Um, and there's there's been significant discussion that there will not be any clustering of the affordability. So we are looking for incorporation of affordability in, in all uh, components of the residential if possible. So, um, and one of the things that we've all stressed as well, there should be not any differences in finishings and sizes of units or, or amenities. Um, everything should um, be very equitable uh, between the market rate and the affordable housing. Um, I will say 
that I know Greg and I have had significant experience in utilizing modular construction to assist us in trying to attain some of that affordability. Um, so we are interested in um, hopefully incorporating that in our in our residential design. So that would be a, a great addition if someone on the team, design team has some experience uh, in modular construction. I think that would be very, very helpful. Um, so as Brian went through the, the slides of the different phases, um, probably the best area where we can capture some of that affordability and potential modular construction is in our phase one. So I'm not sure if that will really be captured in the master plan. Uh, but in the adaptive reuse yet challenging um, because those buildings um, um, have very large and deep floor plates, but it should be a great opportunity for designers to really put uh, pencil to, to, to the pad to really kind of figure out how to do those buildings in a very design effective way so that we don't have these huge units that will not be able to um, accommodate affordability. So we will be looking for you all to be very creative and thoughtful um, when it comes towards building 83 and building 624 to, to help incorporate affordability in those phases. Great, thank you, Leslie. And Ensemble Mosaic, could you um, just kind of clarify, we've had a couple of questions about that chapel block that you just mentioned, Leslie. Um, can you clarify and just revisit the idea of that development being concurrent and where the design responsibilities will fall for the master planning team or not for that? And just share a little bit more about the chapel itself. So we did, um, we have decided to really move concurrently. So for the chapel block, which is uh, a combination of the 600, we're anticipating around 600 um, residential units along with the 75,000 square foot spec life science building, um, parking, we have the barracks building um, for the potential hotel conversion. Um, so that will be going on concurrently. We have not selected that design team yet, but we should be selecting that team very shortly. And as we just discussed, there will be able the opportunity to be collaborative um, in that regard. Um, and for the chapel itself, yes, we are intending to incorporate that in uh, the plans of doing some kind of renovations to that building. We think it's a really uh, iconic part of the Navy Yard. We wanna be able to utilize it uh, along with the hotels to be able to do wedding events and, and outdoor um, weddings and things of that nature. So we are definitely incorporating the renovation um, of some level and degree of the chapel itself. Great. And I, I, um, I'd like to just add one or two things because in, in looking at the uh, specific question. So uh, while the design is not underway, um, that that design um, will be led by a separate design team uh, than the master plan team. And the master, there will be some coordination uh, of those efforts, um, but that, that design will not fall under the master plan design team's design. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, a few questions of kind of about some of the environmental and sustainability elements of the scope. Um, the first, Kate, is the questions of how much consideration is given to resiliency and are there sea level rise studies and have we been in touch with the Army Corps of Engineer for wetland replacement or would such studies be something the selected team would be expected to undertake? Okay, so yes, we are in the floodplain. Um, and I, you know, I think Ensemble Mosaics team um, is going to have a fair amount to say on this because we've worked closely with the Army Corps, FEMA, and the City of Philadelphia Office of Sustainability um, to ensure that both the development that's occurred up till now is compliant with uh, sea level rise uh, projections. And, you know, we'll certainly carry that through with the new development. I think in terms of studies that have been done, you know, the Office of Sustainability has done a lot of work on this, um, as well as the Army Corps. And, you know, FEMA has recently updated their floodplain uh, 
requirements too, I think about a year or two ago. So, uh, you know, those will all be taken into consideration and should be taken into consideration in the master plan. Um, and Ensemble Mosaic, maybe one of you guys can talk about uh, how you incorporate that at the project level, as well as, um, you know, sort of more broadly through the conceptual plan. Sure. Um, so uh, a, a couple, com I'll say a couple components to the answer to this question. I think, you know, first and foremost, as you know, uh, the developer and owner that's going to own these buildings, we absolutely need uh, the master plan to take into account uh, floodplain, sea, sea level rise. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that, you know, as, as we will be investing in these buildings, uh, that our investment is protected. Um, specifically related to um, the, the wetlands, uh, we will be doing a full wetland uh, delineation. Uh, we have not had specific conversations um, with the Army Corps about um, uh, a very specific relocation opportunities for those wetlands, but uh, that will be part of that um, wetland study. Um, that, wet, that detailed wetland study and, and delineation will be occurring concurrent with the master plan, uh, but is not part of the master plan scope. Um, the master plan will need to take into account, uh, you know, what the findings of that delineation are, um, and, you know, also um, how we can manage the floodplain, the stormwater, our proximity to the river, um, and, and ultimately protect our, uh, our, our investment and the public spaces uh, and, and everything else that is occurring uh, and will occur at the Navy Yard. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, another question that we had related to where the Navy Yard is situated um, is that the Navy Yard is in the flight path of the Philadelphia International Airport. And the question is, that, does the development team have any priorities related to air quality or human health as related to being in the flight path? And Kate or Ensemble Mosaic, I don't know if either of you would prefer to answer that first. Probably Ensemble and Mosaic, I would guess. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I think our, um, our overall goal uh, for this development uh, is uh, really to create an extremely sustainable environment um, where all, um, you know, kind of health concerns, whether that be air quality, um, you know, healthy lifestyles, quality of life are taken into uh, account. Um, specifically, uh, what that means related to the flight path itself um, is, is actually a, a unique question and one I don't have a specific answer for, um, but we do know that um, indoor air quality in our buildings, um, especially in uh, post-COVID world, uh, is a critical consideration for us uh, as we develop both for, you know, uh, the residents, but also for the, the commercial side uh, of it, and, and specifically related to the life science companies that we look to attract, um, you know, the, the air quality within those buildings is um, uh, one of the, the key um, building infrastructure items uh, that gets included in the development of, of those particular projects. Um, but overall, uh, our goal is that we will be developing um, and creating uh, a lead ND, lead neighborhood development project. Um, and we really want to think about sustainability beyond just the scale of the buildings um, and really think about the entire development and community as a whole. Uh, so uh, related to that question, um, that would be something that, you know, we would want to understand better. Yeah, so if I can just add to that, just kind of in a larger lens, uh, you know, in the years I've spent around uh, manufacturing the CGMP buildings, that's been something that's been relatively standard around kind of air quality and air movement within those spaces. Where it hasn't been standard is primarily in the low-income communities and in areas around uh, 
where people have insecurities. We're talking about food insecurities, health insecurities, transportation insecurities. If you think about this development, some people consider it kind of this urban suburban mindset, but we want you to add a lens to that, which is how do we make sure that we're respecting people of mixed income communities, which by, by definition brings mixed race. And so you, you, we have to really take into account all of the subtleties of air quality, of transportation, of traffic, of people who have uh, limited um, uh, income where they may not be able to afford a car. And really, as you move lower in the income scale, as many people on this call know, they're more dependent on public infrastructure uh, than ever. So environmental, overall, you know, the, the larger word, environmental quality of this development is really critical to our success in all respects. So I would just say that for this team, you should be looking at opportunities to bring kind of first world thinking to communities that haven't had access to that. And that would be something that would be preferred in this development moving forward. Great, thank you. I think so that addressed as well a question we got about the intent to eventually pursue LEED and certification. Um, and there was another question about if early funds may be allocated for us to register the LEED and D project shortly after the consultant puts their work together. I think that's something that we might expect to see a consideration and um, proposal for in your proposal in the compensation section. Um, we are given the, the priority of that goal. I think it's something that we would be open to discussing, um, but would like to see more in the, in the proposal. And then we've had a couple of questions related to market analysis. So can Kate, you address the expectation for any commercial and residential market analysis and maybe Ensemble Mosaic elaborate on expectations, if any, around housing and residential market analyses on unit mix, pricing and phasing? I'm actually gonna kick that one over to Brian because I think Ensemble Mosaic is best positioned to talk about what they're undertaking on their own in terms of market analysis and how they see the master plan playing into this. Sure. Um, so uh, we are obviously uh, creating a, a new residential submarket as we discussed. Um, there will need to be a lot of analysis done on, uh, you know, kind of that aspect uh, of our development um, to really figure out that um, that that target, not just I'll say kind of demographic, because I think we're really looking at this as extremely inclusive uh, from a standpoint of of demographics, both um, income, uh, but you know age, um, uh, race, all of that. Um, I think that. Uh, on the commercial side as well, we are, um, you know, looking at a building upon uh, a relatively new product type uh, related to uh, a focus on cell and gene therapy. Um, our plan uh, uh, is that we will be working uh, on a, an overall marketing plan for the Navy Yard, um, and that is something that is critical for for us um, to both uh, understand the demand side, um, but also as it relates to our branding, our outreach, um, our materials, our website. Uh, so as part of that marketing strategy that Ensemble and Mosaic would be doing, we would expect to do um, and have a component of a market analysis complete. Um, uh, that would be a, I'll say, a kind of separate scope from the master plan and really incorporated into our marketing strategy. Um, and, and Gregor, Leslie, I'm not sure if you have anything uh, uh, additional to add to that. I would just add from the retail perspective that, as Brian said, we're creating a new neighborhood, a new submarket. So when we're looking at it from the retail, we are going to be looking for es essential services, you know, businesses and, and retail that will support um, neighborhood needs. So grocery, healthcare. I noticed one of the questions. I think, do we consider clinics um, uh, retail? Yes, um, urgent care. Uh, you know, anything that 
is daycares, you know, that are helpful to building, strengthening and supporting a new neighborhood. And if I can add to that, I don't, I don't think Brian mentioned that we're also uh, building a marketing center uh, that will be on site. So that's a key component of what we're going to do to talk about really what's coming at the Navy Yard. I would just add in terms of the way that we've looked at the Navy Yard, it's, it, uh, you know, Leslie and I work in neighborhoods that are, uh, have been historically food deserts or uh, have been really, really new markets, new communities for new housing, where we've come in and we've brought housing concepts and retail concepts and business concepts where others have kind of shied away from or thought it wouldn't work. And what has worked for us in all cases has been those essential services like food, but it's also daycare, uh, you know, particularly when we're starting to bring mixed income communities, we need to bring again those social services that support their ability to go out and work on a regular basis uh, uh, that might be different from certain communities where a daycare wouldn't have historically worked at the Navy Yard. So the healthcare, daycare, food services, banking services, uh, those amenities that are that are part and parcel of all communities are really some of the thoughts that we want new ideas around uh, as we're moving forward. And then on the residential side, we're really looking for kind of first class residential living where all incomes can benefit from it, whether you represent the top 1% or whether you represent the rest of the percents. So uh, we really do see this as, as a, a community of all. I would add one other thing to this now that I'm thinking through it. Um, one component of the master plan is kind of looking at the paid retained sites. And Dylan had shown the three districts, the historic core, the gate, and uh, what we call League Island Boulevard West, used to be called Langley Avenue, um, which is you know, basically a, you know, a corridor of old Navy warehouses, uh, some of which are usable right now, some of which aren't. Most are in pretty deteriorated condition. Um, but in all three of the, these locations, really uh, looking at these assemblages and figuring out what is the highest and best use of them, um, taking into account what's already there, the ensemble mosaic plan, and not teeing things up for competition, but teeing it up to be the strongest economic driver for the city that we can. And so figuring out what the highest and best use of those parcels on the League Island West corridor is gonna be really important. Um, figuring out you know, what is the highest and best use at the gate consistent with the, with the important values and vision that we outlined, that's gonna be super important too. So there is a market component to that analysis um, even though it's, you know, the each individual consultant team should really think through the best way to do that and then include it in their proposal. Great, thank you all. Um, next, I'll ask Ensemble Mosaic to quickly kind of reiterate some of the, the timeline and overall project schedule that may have been discussed in the development plan. Um, when the historic core, the Mustin districts, when those are the build out of those is expected. And I think maybe in that conversation, also you may be clarifying some of the factors that are driving the end of 2021 deliverable date for this master plan. Uh, sure, I can, I can start on that one. Um, so as we've said, from a, from a timing standpoint, uh, we are really looking at that um, initial phase uh, on chapel that will be kind of going design concurrently with uh, really a goal that we're breaking ground on that entire initial phase. So we're talking about the 600 residential units, the 230 hotel rooms, the 75,000 square feet of uh, lab space and a parking structure to support all of that. Um, in the middle of uh, 2022. Um, that, that is, you know, kind of a, a, a phase that is um, on its, on its own, own kind of schedule outside of the master plan, just, uh, you know, uh, but as I've said, designed concurrently with the master plan. Uh, additionally, uh, we will be looking to commence development on our first Life Sciences building in the Mustin district 
Um, however, due to the nature of that area where uh, we don't have um, infrastructure, we have those wetlands, um, that first building uh, in the Mustin district will really be informed by the master plan. Uh, and so while that is still, uh, it, while that is anticipated and desired to be part of the so-called initial phase, uh, that phase will be tied to uh, the completion of the master plan. Uh, that's envisioned to be approximately 150,000 square feet or so um, in a, you know, kind of two-story configuration. Um, so, you know, ideally, you know, for, from the ensemble mosaic side of this, uh, we would, we would love to get that building out of the ground as quickly as possible. Uh, so I think that is, uh, a, a one of the, the drivers behind the master plan itself. Um, and, you know, overall from a, a phasing and development standpoint, uh, you know, we really envision uh, capitalizing on the momentum, uh, both at the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, we see that there is really a consistent um, development that's occurring throughout this 15 or 20 year time frame where we are building, you know, 250, 000, 250 to 300 residential units and, you know, 150,000 square feet or so of, of life science space, you know, pretty much, you know, starting construction on, on that every, you know, 18 months or so. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, uh, demand will dictate some of that. Um, we see phases that could be much larger um, uh, than that, uh, depending upon, uh, you know, the, the corporate demand and depending upon uh, the residential demand as well. Um, but I think, you know, both from our standpoint, uh, the Ensemble Mosaic standpoint, and, and I think from the PIDC standpoint, you know, the, the master plan really wants to guide that development. Um, and so while um, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate time uh, to have a thoughtful and comprehensive update to this master plan, uh, we also don't want that to hold back uh, the momentum and development that occurs at the Navy Yard. Uh, so we felt that um, the, the timing that we came up for completing this master plan uh, kind of provided both of those as far as uh, the time for a thoughtful um, and, and progressive and creative plan, uh, yet also uh, tying into our desired development timeframes. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, so we have just about 15 minutes left. We're still going through. I know there's a good chunk of questions we haven't answered yet, and we're getting to those. Um, in the event that we run out of time, um, we will be responding to all of these in the written Q&A, and you are welcome to send more questions in to Navy Yard Plan at NavyYard.org after this meeting is over. Um, but we'll keep going through and hopefully get to as many as possible. Um, one quick administrative clarification on the submission in the statement of qualifications, the, the five up to five projects as a um, exemplary projects and relevant experience, that applies to the prime, the lead consultant on the team. Um, we welcome additional experience and project examples for the sub consultants that can be provided as appendices, but the five project requirement is only applicable to the, the lead. And Kate, can you clarify in the scope look in terms of the community engagement, um, are we asking for an engagement expert and what sort of additional engagement and stakeholder outreach is expected through this master planning process? You're gonna test my knowledge of the RFP. Um, so I think there's two components um, to the engagement. One is really interacting with both our stakeholders at the Navy Yard um, our major companies, our employees in a targeted way to really, you know, get feedback um, that will inform the next stage of the master plan. Um, the second group is kind of the communities that we regularly work with that are adjacent to the Navy Yard. Um, and we can share information on that with the selected team and, you know, connect you with the right people. And then the third element is going to be um, 
sort of our municipal and governmental partners. Uh, the city of Philadelphia is really a critical partner of ours, but there are some additional um, state uh, partners as well. So we really wanna make sure that we coordinate with all three of those groups in a, in a smart way to get really good targeted feedback that will drive um, a really feasible, achievable plan. Um, and we, you know, we really want to hear from the teams how you propose to do that. If you have the expertise you know, within your planning shop, that's great. If you want to bring in a sub consultant to, to help uh, facilitate that work, if you think that's been more effective in previous projects, we're open to that too. Um, but we want the teams to really think about what would work best in this scenario and then propose it. Um, and we'll take that into consideration as we evaluate the proposal. All right, thank you, Kate. Um, another question we got is related to how, how do you get MBE certification in Philadelphia if you aren't certified? Um, the City of Philadelphia's Office of Economic Opportunity manages the, the city's OEO registry for MBE, WBE, and DSBE companies. Um, reach out to us at Navy Yard Plan at NavyYard.org and the PIDC team is more than happy to help connect you to the, the right people at the OEO office um, if you aren't currently certified. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the, the Phil City of Philadelphia's registry also captures registrations outside of the city. So if you are certified through other other recognized organizations that certify MBE, WBE, DSBE status, those will also be captured in the OEO's registry and counted towards any participation in your plan. But feel free to reach out if you have any questions about certification and we'll be sure that they get answered. And the next question that I'd like to answer is, or I'd like to pose to the, the team, and um, this may be for Ensemble Mosaic, is the question of if any historical preservation evaluations are required for the existing properties in the master plan. Right, I don't know if, I mean, I can jump in here uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Um, the two buildings that would even qualify would be buildings 83 and 624 that are in the master plan. I'm carving out the, the barracks hotel because that's in our initial phase. Because we are assuming that that needs to have some selective demolition to provide light wells um, and to, to, to just make the, the building more conducive to residential development. The assumption is making that we would not be uh, pursuing any kind of historic tax credits on that, that building. I do know, um, and this is probably to Kelsey or to Kate, that there is at least some general review jurisdiction of the historic um, commission in Philadelphia, but from a historic tax credit perspective, we will not um, most likely be pursuing any tax credits. Okay, and I can speak really quickly to, as Leslie mentioned, the historic preservation and our relationship. So the State Historic Preservation Office does have, as noted in appendices to the RFP, um, review and in some cases approval or co a comment um, responsibilities over different areas of the Navy Yard. There's a zone one and a zone two distinction. The building 83 and 624 that Leslie mentioned, the SHPO as it's known does have comment over those two, we have a, a good working relationship with contacts at the State Historic Preservation Office. They have been down and understand what these buildings are and are you know, very reasonable and we think um, realistic as to what the future of these buildings could be. So again, as we go through the master planning and eventual design and renovation and rehabilitation of those buildings, we as a PIDC Ensemble Mosaic team are happy to facilitate that conversation and relationship. And then Brian, maybe this is a good time to, if you need, if you have any other clarifications around the, the existing ensemble mosaic conceptual plan and how that gets incorporated into the master plan overall. Sure. Um, thank you, Kelsey. <clears throat> so, uh, a, a little bit of, of both background and then I think expectation as it relates to the master plan uh, 
team and and master plan itself. Um, so the conceptual plan that Ensemble Mosaic uh, created as part of its RFP submission um, was one that a, a, a lot of thought went into uh, based on uh, you know our experience, our vision. Um, However, it, it was done in a fairly short time frame. Uh, that plan was really pulled together uh, uh, in, for the most part, less than 60 days. Um, and you know, I think that as part of this planning effort, we absolutely want to review that plan, um, test that plan, um, and you know, are <clears throat> are open to revisions to that plan. I think what is um, uh, critical for 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 us uh, is that we have a, a program uh, from that plan, uh, specifically in the uh, Mustin district, uh, that we feel uh, very confident in. Um, so we will be looking to um, you know keep that type of building typology, that type of programming in place. Um, for the Mustin District, uh, Mustin North District. Mustin North. Uh, for, yeah. Yes, yes, Mustin North District. Thank you, Greg. Um, you know, in in the historic core, uh, you know, we have existing streets, existing infrastructure. Those blocks are already defined. Um, we, we, I think, we've talked a lot about the Chapel Block uh, relative to the remaining uh, sites in the historic core. Uh, similarly, we have kind of a minimum program that we think is critical, uh, specifically related to the number of residential units and the, the density that we think, uh, the minimum density that we think is required to create that vibrant residential district. Um, but I think there's probably uh, a, a little bit more flexibility on how we accomplish that between uh, the additional uh, ground up development site uh, and the two historic buildings. Uh, and then Mustin South probably really represents uh, the area where um, we are, uh, you know, kind of uh, least locked into, um, while again, a lot of thought went into that uh, uh, plan. Uh, we really see that um, area um, where we want to unleash the creativity of the design team. Um, similarly, we, you know, we'll have development targets and program a minimum that we'll want to uh, uh, incorporate. Uh, but I, I think that uh, that that must in South that waterfront district uh, absolutely is a place where we'll be looking for uh, you know a lot of creativity from the master planning team. And if I could just add to that, uh, because part of the part of this process too is for uh, programming that's outside of the ensemble mosaic plan, and so uh, Kate mentioned that particularly at the entrance in League Island, uh, there is a gate here, uh, and that gate should be an emotional gate and not a physical barrier for people who in the past have felt that that was the condition. This is a space where. Uh, and, you know, in the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, we have thought about it from the standpoint of outcomes, which is, are we creating an environment that's both, where people feel both welcomed and valued? And that really starts at the gate. And so it's really important that uh, as we're putting together these programs and processes, that we're thinking about it in terms of the whole ecosystem and, and really not just on the back end where we think that's a real high value target, but it really is. How are people feeling and being brought to these spaces in a way that they're being welcomed and valued? Uh, and, and that will be kind of the design philosophy that we're taking through, but also it's going to be the working mindset that we have with the teams that we'll be working with both through the master planning process, but all throughout the development. Great, thank you, Greg and Brian. Um, in the last few minutes, Kate, could you address a few questions we've gotten related to teaming? The first question is whether any consultants on the selected team would also be able to contract and provide services for the developer team being Ensemble Mosaic. And the second question being, if you could talk a little bit around the exclusivity that we've required for MBE, WBE firms in, in the consultant teaming. 
Okay, let's start with the second one. Um, do you mean the non exclusivity? Correct, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, so one of the things that's really important to us with this, uh, you know, long-term undertaking with Ensemble Mosaic is using it as an opportunity to really incorporate um, firms from, you know, that are MBE firms or WBE firms that maybe haven't had an opportunity to work at the Navy Yard or looking for opportunities to grow um, over a longer term project. Um, and this is really the first joint contract that we're gonna be issuing uh, to that regard. And so we really wanna make sure that that opportunity exists. Um, and so to encourage, you know, to make sure that we can maximize participation, um, sub consultants, uh, you know, we really feel strongly that they should not be limited uh, to participating on just one team. Um, and I understand, you know, that that, that may uh, create some concerns on the part of uh, prime contractors, um, but I think everyone it can be relied on to be professional and give their best to each of the endeavors that they're uh, committing to. So um, it's really connected to that goal of really bringing on more companies um, and helping these companies grow over the course of this initiative. Um, Kelsey, what was the first question again? The first question is if there are consultants in the master planning team, would they also be able to contract and do work with the developer team? Um, you know, my take on that is, I, I think especially in this initial phase with the chapel block moving on a parallel track, there probably are gonna be um, situations where that can occur. And, you know, the question really comes down to conflict of interest. And if, you know, we're working in very close partnership with Ensemble Mosaic and the master planning team is gonna be working closely with the specific design professionals that are working on the project level with Ensemble Mosaic. Um, I think we're all working toward the same goal. Um, and generally, I think that would be okay but it would have to be a case-by-case -case analysis where we just you know, go through, make absolutely sure there's no conflict. Um, but from my perspective, I think there can be some um, overlap. And I, I would really like it if uh, Brian and Greg could chime in on this also, just to give their perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Kate. I think the answer is yes. Uh, we, and, and you know, there's some short-term issues that I think that might be more, um, uh, a specific to both the master planning team and the first phase of what we're doing, but this is a program that's going to go on for the next 15 years. And uh, we're looking to partner with those that really share a value system, that understand what we're doing, that are focused on building kind of an equitable development throughout the process uh, from the beginning to the end. And so uh, for those teams that are working with us, that share those values, we want to continue to work with in, uh, in small and large capacities. So the answer globally would be yes. Great. Well, we are just about on time. Um, there's one last question or a few questions that have arisen that I just wanna clarify. It kind of speaks to the same um, teaming question um, with the, the statement of qualifications, which asks for no more than five projects of a similar scope and magnitude. That's, that's meant as a maximum. Um, if, if the proposal that's provided does not have, has three exemplary projects, that is by no means meant as to be any sort of disqualification or anything of the sort. Um, it's just up to five, just so that we can keep proposals to a manageable review. And so if you have anywhere between one and five for the, the lead, and then if, if you have more than that and more from the consultants on the team, that you would like to provide as an appendix, we will look at those as time allows as well. Um, so you know, we would certainly be open to a, a, a proposal that is representing sort of a joint venture of several teams that together would deliver five key projects and, and supplemental projects can go in the appendix. Less than five is not a disqualification factor. Um, we are just about of time, out, out of time. Um, I think there may have been a few questions. Thank you all for submitting so many questions that we didn't get to. If that's the case, um, we will be copying down this chat and making sure that all questions that we're able to respond to are responded to in the written Q&A. 
Um, you are welcome to continue to send questions through next Friday to Navy Yard Plan at NavyYard.org. And we will capture those as well in the written document. And that document will be distributed to everyone who registered for this call and everyone who downloaded the RFP, as well as posted on the, the PIDC website where you downloaded the RFP. You can find all of that information here in a couple of weeks by Friday, January the 29th. Um, thank you everyone for the time this morning um, and for all of the attention and very robust questions. We hope that this has been really helpful for clarifying the RFP and Kate, Ensemble Mosaic, I don't know if y'all would like to leave any last minute closing remarks before we close this. And again, we'll redistribute this recording for future viewing. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for uh, making the time, for having the interest in the RFP. Um, and really urge you, if you have any questions, just shoot them over. We'll get your response as quickly as possible. Um, and just very excited uh, to have so much interest in this. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.